Today was a very impressive day in the stock market. The NASDAQ 100 went to a 52-week high. Not only that, but of course, a lot of key components within that index did quite well and is at their own 52-week highs, and that includes Microsoft, that includes Alphabet, that includes Meta. So today was a spectacular day for the tech and communication sectors. We're gonna get into a number of those charts in tonight's video. We're also gonna look at some macro charts, and one of the surprises that happened today was that the US dollar and interest rates both rose pretty significantly on a day when the market was rocking it to the upside, which was a little bit different than what we experienced in most of 2022. After we get through all of that analysis, we'll then get into our trade application example, where I wanted to focus on a company that used to be part of the technology sector that has recently switched to the financials and is bouncing up and off of its rising 30-day moving average quite nicely. So we're gonna try to take advantage of that with a bull put spread. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's May 18th, 2023. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into the description area. Make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. Remember at the bottom of those emails, you'll also find which stocks are giving you overbought and oversold cluster signals within the S&P 500. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Zee. We really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related posts. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And as you can see here with the heat map of the S&P 500, uh, it was a pretty promising day, all things considered. Uh, there was a lot more green here today uh, than what we witnessed uh, here uh, on Tuesday when I was last with you. Remember that day was kind of a day where the market was down less than a percent, but it was really a, a terrible breadth of day underneath the market's hood where you only had just a handful of mega cap names leading the way. Now you still had that theme leading today and maybe we can go through some of those charts a little bit later as tonight's video will be a full length video, but you'll notice here that Google had another good day up 1.68%. That is a brand new 52 week high for Alphabet. Uh, Meta was up 1.8%. That was a new 52 week high for Meta. Microsoft was up 1.44%. That was a new 52 week high for Microsoft and Nvidia was up nearly 5% today. That was a new 52 week high on Nvidia. Apple was just shy of a 52 week high, uh, but it had a nice day as well, up 1.37%. Broadcom had a very nice 3% up day. That's a new 52 week high for it. Some of you saw me tweeting about Synapsis or Synopsis uh, here earlier today. That happens to be one of the stocks that we own as a coffee can stock, similar to uh, Microsoft and Google in my top-down trend trading class. Uh, in other words, it's a stock that had more than doubled for us that we sold half of our shares of a few years back and have retained the remaining shares uh, as kind of a forever holding. And uh, that stock hit an all-time high today, up 8.5%. It was one of the top stocks in the entire market today. It barely missed out on uh, the top status because another well-known uh, tech-related play, in this case in the communication services area, Netflix had a stellar day. It was up 9% here today on some positive news about some of their ad tiers uh, that they came out with. So it was a really nice uh, day across the board. Another one, by the way, I should mention is Copart. It was up about 7% today. Uh, that's a kind of a under the radar stock that just keeps working over the years as well. A tremendous moat kind of in the um, car auctions types of space and uh, some of that uh, type of, uh, of business there, uh, but uh, very profitable business nonetheless. Uh, Capital One had a very good day. Remember we talked about Capital One on Tuesday, talking about how it was that day basically the only financial that was up that day because that was when the market realized that Berkshire Hathaway took a substantial stake. It was up another 5% today. Uh, BlackRock had a great day today, uh, up almost 3%. We were talking about that one a little bit in my Q&A class earlier as it had just touched the blue line on the market, uh, on the market scholars uh, dividend stair step chart here last week. Uh, in other words, 
it had sold off enough where its dividend yield became attractive enough for long-term investors. And anybody who would have grabbed it at 630 bucks last week, probably pretty happy about that decision as it's basically at $670 per share right now. So up $40 per share in a week. Uh, you also saw that JP Morgan had a reasonable day up nearly a percent. We've been doing some swing trading on that one in, in some of my classes. Uh, TFC, one of the regional banks that's been blasted here lately, came firing back a little bit, up 3%. Chubb was up nearly a percent. I was tweeting about that one yesterday. They just announced their 30th straight uh, dividend increase, 30 years in a row, uh, for that dividend aristocrat. Um, let's see, it looks like some of the energy stocks did okay. EQT had a 5% day, so pretty solid performance there as well. I mean, it's kind of hard pick to pick and choose. It, it was such a good day all over. Here's Here was the best performing stock in the S&P 500, by the way. This is Take-Two Interactive. So for those of you that are Grand Theft Auto fans, that video game series dates back quite a long time at this point. Uh, I'm pretty old school myself, but uh, I even remember when that game came out uh, back during my college years. So uh, that series uh, continues to take in the profits as the years have rolled on. And today, investors were awarded with an 11% jump there for Take-Two Interactive. So it was a really nice day. Um, tremendous strength, by the way, out of technology in general, right? We kind of talked about some of the bigger names, but this was not just a, a mega cap story today, the way that it was on Tuesday. All of the technology companies were kind of you know, um, pulling their weight, so to speak. Uh, even Cisco, some of you saw me joking on Twitter saying that Cisco put in the old uh, stiletto uh, candlestick pattern. Uh, because if you pull up a, a daily chart on, on Cisco right now, it looks like a woman's shoe uh, because uh, you, it gapped down this morning about 4% um, off of their earnings reaction and spent the rest of the day rallying straight up. Not only did it um, get back to break even from 4% down, uh, but it actually closed higher by over a percent today and is actually up in the after hour session a bit more. So you don't see that too often, but that was an extreme candle that uh, Cisco put in today. Uh, a lot of the semiconductors you know, doing quite well, even the software companies. So technology in general had a heck of a session. Uh, if you pull up XLK, it actually hit new highs. Um, new 52-week highs, as did XLC. So XLK uh, is the market cap weighted uh, sector ETF for technology, and XLC is the market cap weighted ETF for the sector of communications. Both of those very important sectors hit 52-week highs today, kind of following suit with Apple and Microsoft doing very well in addition to NVIDIA uh, on the tech side and Alphabet and Meta uh, here, along with Netflix on the uh, communication side. In terms of where there was weakness today, um, it was in some of the areas, sadly, that I'm a little bit more uh, familiar with as a dividend investor. A lot of the healthcare names really been struggling here lately. In fact, I think a lot of the healthcare names are quite attractive for a long-term investor. I could be wrong about that, of course, but judging by how some of them have really been blitzed here in the last several weeks and months, a lot of them have quite attractive dividend yields right now. You know, Amgen comes to mind as just one example. It was down a touch here today. Uh, it was really out of favor here earlier this week as it was uh, announced that their expected buyout of Horizon Ther Therapeutics is going to be blocked by uh, the FTC. So. Uh, you know, there's kind of some, some, some nerves floating around in the healthcare space right now that merger and acquisition activity may come grinding to a halt like we've seen in some of the other areas of the market as well. So healthcare seemed to be out of favor today. You also saw that the consumer staples and utilities were also out of favor. Again, a couple of more dividend-oriented areas, healthcare, consumer staples, utilities. I think of all of those areas as dividend-focused. And then you don't see it here because, again, Thinkorswim, unfortunately, has still not updated their, their resources for the uh, sector transition that took place back in mid-March. It's actually going on two months now. So if anybody has any contacts over at Thinkorswim, maybe uh, you know, float that idea past them to get it updated. But uh, unfortunately, real estate doesn't really show up. If I clicked on it, one single stock, CBRE shows up here, but it does not show the actual REITs, which is pretty much 99% of the real estate sector. So uh, what I would tell you is if it would show up, uh, real estate would have looked like utilities where it was mostly in the red here today. So again, when I think of kind of 
dividend cash flowing businesses and specifically from the sector level, I think of consumer staples, healthcare, utilities, and REITs, and they just all happen to be the ones that were out of favor today. So this is definitely a growth focused rally once again that we are witnessing here. As we come on over here now to the main part of the platform, we can see that there were 341 out of the 500 stocks up in the S&P 500 today. So that is good for about a 68% hit rate. It's a heck of a lot better than what we were looking at on Tuesday. Remember that day it was only 12% of stocks that were up. So uh, today was a vast improvement compared to what we witnessed just a couple of days ago. So hopefully that's a good sign, right? It, it means that there's more participation, more willingness from investors that may have been sitting on the sidelines to put some of that cash to work. And remember, we're kind of blowing around right now uh, in the market with the, the whims of what's happening with the debt ceiling. Uh, even here in the after hour session tonight, there's you know headlines that are making news and you know this, that, and the other thing. So just be prepared for you know any potential whipsaws and volatility. But in general, you know, when we see a lot of um, important stocks and important sectors hitting 52-week highs that's generally speaking a bullish thing. And so um, let me pop on over here to the charts real quick and uh, let me first start our conversation with the swing trading chart. And I'm gonna pull up a one year chart just to kind of give you a lay of the land here. Now you'll notice the S&P 500 itself is not yet at a 52 week high. That occurred back here in August of last year where we stand right now actually is only second to that area. So in other words, notice we did cross a very important level today. Notice over here on SPY, this was on February 2nd, the S&P 500 did cross up and over that important resistance area. Remember, we had struggled to get up and over that area as recently as right here on May 1st. Remember, we failed there and we, it, we, it resulted in a, a pretty uh, vicious four day pullback right there that ended up below the moving average. So that wasn't the greatest of looks on that first attempt. This is much more substantial, much stronger. Uh, in fact, we were kind of looking at this in my swing trading class yesterday morning. We pulled up this exact chart and saying how this is starting to look like a legitimate bounce right here on this candle. So it only emboldens, emboldens us further once we see this follow-up candle that we received today and where we ended on that candle was near the high, which is a great sign there as well, giving you the suggestion that had the market been open longer, we probably would have continued to push even higher. Uh, and we ended the session. So remember the close is just as important as where we were trading on an intraday basis. We closed at a level above the intraday high on February 2nd. So now, and, and by the way, it, it's up and over this other hump over here back in June of last year as well. So the only um, remaining uh, you know, level to take out over the last year is kind of this one or two week period of time in mid-August of last year. So pretty good sign there. And again, it's been a, a narrowly focused rally for the most part. So for the big tech companies to be able to do the work that they did has been nothing short of breathtaking. So that's what the SPY looks like. Now let's look at a number of those securities that I've mentioned before that are hitting 52 week highs. So let's start with XLK. That is your market cap weighted uh, sector ETF for technology. And look at this impressive four day rally we are in the midst of. I mean, oh my goodness, that sucker is taking off. We didn't even need the last three days. We were already breaking a new highs four days ago. So that just goes to show we're just, we're just piling on at this point. And uh, you, can, you can thank a stock like NVIDIA for the way that that XLK chart looks. Here's NVIDIA. This is another stock that we have in my top-down trend trading class that's been working quite nicely for us over the months, as you can imagine. And just like XLK, NVIDIA is in the midst of a four-day rally right here as well. And this thing was up 5% today. Keep in mind, this is a massive company these days. I think sometimes people are surprised by that. NVIDIA is larger than Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> so if you look at the uh, market cap back here on the, uh, on, the, on the heat map, you'll see it's nearly an $800 billion company. Berkshire Hathaway, of course, the famous company run by Warren Buffett, is a $700 billion company. So at this moment in time, 
NVIDIA, a company that many people have never heard of, is bigger than Berkshire Hathaway. So it has been an, an amazing run for NVIDIA as they are one of the central uh, processing chips of the AI revolution and a number of other things. They've had a lot of uh, successes over the years, but uh, that sucker is all-time highs here. Um, now, they do have an earnings coming up, so you know sometimes people have a tendency to get uh, really excited about a chart that looks like it's breaking out, but then they're not thinking in advance that, oh, there could be a rug pull in event in front of us. Now, on the flip side of that conversation, there could also be uh, a continued air pocket above us. So the point is, we don't know what earnings will bring. Uh, it will likely bring volatility, and it's just a matter of whether you're willing to play that game or not. But going into earnings, this thing surely is uh, quite strong. So that is one of the key reasons why XLK is breaking out to 52-week highs. And then I'd also throw Microsoft into that conversation. As mentioned before, this is one of our coffee can stocks in my top-down trend trading class. Also a stock that we had the, the pleasure of buying many, many years ago in my dividend growth investing class when everybody hated it and it had a 3% yield. These days, of course, everybody has fallen in love with Microsoft and it's a completely different sentiment around the company. But it is also pulling its weight as this thing has also been up four days in a row uh, to new 52-week highs. I'm not sure if this one is all-time highs. NVIDIA is, I, th I think... I'd actually have to double check on that as well. They both pulled back so hard last year that I, I would need to double check that. Let's see. Yeah, Microsoft is not quite to all-time highs. You'd have to get back to late 2021 uh, before we get back there. And NVIDIA might be the same. Yeah, it is. We're getting really close on NVIDIA to all-time highs though. You know, another big day. Heck, it could happen when it reports earnings here uh, next week. Uh, it, the all-time high on it is just $30 higher than where it is right now. So it's not too far away from that perspective. Apple also is kind of in that conversation. Apple just barely missed out on an intraday basis of hitting their 52-week high, but you can see how close they are to all-time highs there as well. So you know, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people remain pretty negative on this market, and for good reasons. I mean, a lot of people are anticipating we're still heading towards a recession, we're still dealing with inflation and all this type of stuff, but you look at some of the most important stocks in the entire stock market, and many of them are a stone's throw away from all-time highs. And so usually those two things don't mesh, like bearishness deriving from possible recession on the horizon, inverted yield curve, all this kind of stuff, and the most important growth-oriented stocks of our era um, basically knocking on the door of all-time highs. Um, so those have been some of the more impressive kind of technology-oriented types of companies that are out there. Um, that Synopsis, by the way, that other one that I had mentioned, that's kind of an under the radar company that uh, is one of our coffee can stocks as well. Here's what that candle looks like, an impressive 8.5% move there on Synopsis, and that did push it to all-time highs in this case. Notice this is a three-year chart here, but if we were to go back to a maximum chart, you can see uh, Synopsis uh, unlike all those others that I rattled off, is not just hitting a 52-week high today. This is all-time highs for Synopsis. Um, let me go back to the normal one-year daily view because I wanted to also hit upon the communication sector. That was the other key sector that, as you can see when I pull up XLC, is now hitting 52-week highs. Now, it did produce an overbought cluster signal today, so be aware of that. It doesn't always have to stall things out, but it can. Uh, you'll notice that over here, you had an overbought cluster signal. And you kind of had sideways action for the next week before another big move higher. Um, and then on that day, you had a second kind of follow-up overbought cluster signal, and that really did it in, right? Had you sold on that candle, you would have avoided you know, a pretty nasty haircut that would have uh, happened for the next month or so after that. So you know, we might be getting kind of a little bit long in the tooth here, but um, when you look at the distance between where XLC is and its 30-day moving average, notice when you just eyeball it, it doesn't look particularly extended. Over here, I think we would have agreed that that was a, a, a bit beyond the norm, right? Having that huge gap up and having this massive amount between where it was trading and the moving average. This feels a little bit more sustainable here. Whether it actually works out, I don't know. But it, it doesn't it doesn't feel particularly extended here compared to the way I would have felt about it back on this one over here. So we'll we'll keep our eye on that one moving forward. But like I mentioned there. On Twitter, um, you know, the, the NASDAQ is following Google, and Google is one of the key 
companies within XLC. So here's what Google's chart looks like. Uh, we are now at 52 week highs on Google, or if you want to call it Alphabet, be my guest. Uh, but uh, that push here today got us up and over that hump right there on August 15th. So we now have outperformance from that perspective. Again, remember the S&P 500 is not yet trading above its hump there in August 15th time period, but Google is. So that's one way that you can kind of judge that outperformance. And that's saying something because remember, Google had been an underperformer for a long time. Notice that I have this dotted um, kind of gold bars on my, um, on my screen here. And that is the pathway of the S&P 500 over the past year. And up until the last four days, Google had basically been underperforming the market for the vast majority of the last year. It wasn't until the last four days where it is now once again outperforming the market at large. Um, not to be outdone, I had mentioned Meta as well, the company associated with Facebook. And you can see Meta uh, is out there rocking it as well to a new 52 week high. Uh, and this one has been outperforming for you know the last couple of months. So it's not quite as surprising in this case as Google was, but nonetheless, that is you know an impressive batch of companies that are really working right now some of the most important common stocks in the market that are supported by some of the most important sectors within the market right now so it has been you know glory days are back again it kind of feels like with with some of those growth oriented areas anyway let's get back on over here to our typical routine now and look at our our traditional four grid and you'll see here that we do have the S&P 500 up nearly a percent today, not quite, but um, it obviously is now breaking to new three month highs. And you can see the background color has turned to green, telling us that that is a strongly bullish posture once again. So notice that we have had a little bit more flip flop type of action here recently. And sometimes technical indicators will do that, right? It's uh, it's a tougher market when the market is kind of blowing around at the whims of what's happening in Washington, D.C., because one day you get a, a positive story, the next day it's a negative, and, and so on and so forth. But I think we can agree that the, that the tilt of the S&P 500's chart right now remains to the upside. If you were to look at this chart and just kind of isolate in on the colors of the background, I think we would all mostly agree that within the last two months of this three month chart, we've seen way more green background color than pink. And so the path of least resistance to my eye remains to the upside. You can also see the, the, the 30 day moving average is tilted higher at this moment and prices above it. We know that because the moving average is colored green in this case. So strongly bullish posture, stock is above rising moving average, S&P 500 up nearly a percent here today. Off to the right hand side here, you will see that the Dow also was up today. And remember that was being called into question first thing in the morning when Cisco, a key member of the, the Dow, uh, looked like they were gonna you know, bomb it uh, or you know, pull the rug on it or something. But you know, as I mentioned before, um, Cisco, if you wanna see what that chart looks like, by the way, I never did show you, um, take a look at that candle on Cisco today. Uh, it, it gapped down to start the day down here to where I'm kind of circling with my mouse and it spent the rest of the day rallying, 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 closing at the high of the day and is now uh, trading a little bit higher in the after hours session as well. So that's a very oddball chart right there. So you can kind of see what I mean about that, that stiletto uh, look right there with that strange candle formation. So with Cisco being an important member of the Dow Jones, it kind of made it look like it was gonna struggle early in the morning today, but came fighting back with the best of them. You know, and I also throw kind of Home Depot into that conversation, spent a lot of time talking about Home Depot uh, today in my question and answer session with my premium students. But notice how they were willing to throw Home Depot away just a couple of days ago. Some of you saw that I posted on Twitter that for the first time since um, March of 2020 during the COVID era, uh, Home Depot had a 3% dividend yield when it was trading under $278 here first thing on Tuesday morning. But it rallied for the rest of the day. It rallied even harder uh, after that uh, here yesterday, and it continued to rally today. So all of a sudden, Home Depot is literally at their weekly high the same week when uh, they reported 
what the, the, the news headlines that were out there trying to scare you saying that they just reported their worst revenue miss in 20 years. And so that has to be quite disheartening to some of the bears of Home Depot out there to see this type of response to that type of a headline. But that's another example of you know some of the resilience we've seen in the market here more recently. So the Dow didn't do nearly as well as you know the S&P 500 or the Nasdaq because there's not as much tech exposure in the Dow. But the fact that it closed higher today might have been a surprise to some who were expecting it to close lower upon the recognition of the um, of the the Cisco news. Now remember, Walmart also reported their earnings, and so that had an impact here to a degree as well. So a decent day out of the Dow, but I'm not gonna you know throw a parade for it or anything. It did underperform today. It was only up 0.34 percent, but. This is a second straight rally for the Dow. You can see that that was enough to push the background color back to light green, telling us that we have a weekly bullish posture there. So it's not strongly bullish like the S&P 500, but hey, take what we can get. However, there is a fly in the ointment, and that is that the Dow is now, believe it or not, the only one of these four US equity indices that is trading below its 30-day moving average. Even the lowly old Russell 2000 is doing that all of the sudden down below. Speaking of which, you can see the Russell 2000 was up 0.58% today. So uh, it wasn't um, the laggard, uh, not as much as the Dow, but it was kind of in that territory. Again, remember that the mega cap tech rally that we've been witnessing with all those stocks like Alphabet and Meta and you know Microsoft and Nvidia, none of those companies are in the Russell 2000. So they don't get that benefit the way that the other indices do. Nonetheless, there has been stabilization here. Uh, even in some of those you know, regional banks that had been, you know, out of favor for quite some time. And so starting to see stabilization there, I like what I see. Um, it might mean that if this market is destined to go higher, that Russell 2000 has a little bit more catch up um, to make to the upside. So uh, I would say that that was some pretty positive action there for the Russell 2. Yesterday, it got above its rising moving average. Today, it followed through with that, changed it from a weekly bullish background to a strongly bullish background in doing so. And for two straight days, we basically closed at the high of the session. We did so uh, four days ago as well, but the problem is the one day in between we closed at the lows of the day. So the, the Russell has been pretty volatile here and there. Remember the Russell I think uh, is probably due for a reconstitution here in June I think is usually when, when Russell does that. So that could have an impact uh, on prices there uh, as well. Uh, so we have Strongly bullish posture, price above rising moving average on the Russell 2000 as well. And then uh, in the lower left-hand corner here where we're looking at the NASDAQ, of course, this is the story of the day, right? This is, this is the go-to index for bullish traders at the moment. You can't hardly do anything wrong if you're a tech stock. And of course, the NASDAQ is known for tech stocks. And you can see it was up 1.51% today easily leading all, all of these charts. And remember, I've been saying that a lot lately. So sometimes you get the sense, oh, it was a leader today because it's snapping back from an old oversold condition or something like that. No, the NASDAQ has basically been leading us for the last two or three months, um, for the better part of it at least. So this is not like new information. It's not like we just woke up today and discovered that the NASDAQ is a leader. It's been happening right in front of our eyes, and we've been looking at it you know, almost nightly here uh, in these videos. Now, again, I will stress that eventually the good times have to come to an end, but when that happens you know, is not uh, easily determined ahead of time. We look for clues, we look for markers, and I'll say the same thing that I mentioned, I think with the, I think it was the communications chart that I showed you before. We did end up with an overbought cluster signal on the NASDAQ composite today. We had all three of those market forecast lines in the upper reversal zone at the same time. Notice we already had one of those overbought cluster signals back here on May 11th. And that really didn't do much to slow this, this freight train to the upside. Yes, you did go sideways for about four days, but judging by the last two epic days that we've seen here on the NASDAQ composite, I wouldn't really say that that, you know, quote unquote, worked to slow this train down. Maybe the second one will because things are kind of starting to feel a little bit parabolic here all of a sudden. We are seeing some gigantic moves. Again, think about NVIDIA just, you know, on a, on a single case basis there. An $800 billion company 
that was up 5% today and it didn't even report earnings or anything like that, right? So we're talking about massive amounts of money movement taking place here at the moment. So NASDAQ remains the star of the show. Of course it has a strongly bullish posture, just like it has for the vast majority of the last two months. Uh, and of course, it still is trading above its rising 30-day moving average. So um, good news here for the bulls. All four of our charts have bullish postures with the Dow Jones being weakly bullish and the others being strongly bullish. And only the Dow Jones uh, is the only one of these four that is not trading above its rising 30 day moving average right now. So that's all constructive activity. That's an improvement upon what we've seen. So as long as something you know um, erratic doesn't happen there out of Washington DC to spoil the party, things are, are looking pretty solid here all of a sudden. Uh, let's go ahead and now pop on over here to the internet now that we're at the halfway mark. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support these presentations. Remember, these presentations take at least three hours of our time uh, as we're doing everything on our own. Uh, and so uh, they are a free video. We do, the for, do them for promotional purposes of our business of Market Scholars, but we're hopeful that our time is well spent and you guys become educated as well. So that way it's a, a double bonus. You get a benefit, we get a benefit. But the only way we can get a benefit is if you guys are willing to support us. So as I always say, as long as we get at least 100 people clicking like, uh, I'm more than happy to do a full length video there for you that comes in closer to an hour. On the other hand, I certainly understand that some of you don't like those longer videos either. And so I want to give you an opportunity to kind of voice your opinion. And if you don't click like, and most of you are not clicking like, and we're under 100 likes, then I'll just do a 15 minute version of the video just like I did on Tuesday. So it, it, it is up to you collectively. Do you want the, the additional charts, the additional analysis, the trade applications? Remember on the 15 minute version, there's no trade application either. So uh, if you guys want to support it, it it's not hard. Uh, you know, we try to make it as easy as possible for you by locating that in four different areas, including pinned to the top of my timeline here on Twitter itself. Otherwise, you can look at the bottom of the um, video on our website when you're watching this, this little Twitter widget here. You can click the heart button there. You can also find uh, the, the tweet in question in the description area of the YouTube video for those of you that choose to watch this video directly on YouTube. And then last but not least, you can also find the tweeting question in the Twitter icon on the emails we send you down towards the bottom. So whatever one of those four uh, ways you choose to help us along, it doesn't matter. They all end up tallying up in the same area. So uh, those of you that help us with that, we appreciate that. Uh, it's free of charge, right? We're not asking you to pay us for it. It's it, You don't have to give us your, your firstborn child or uh, your, your left arm or anything like that. You just simply have to take five seconds out of your day to click a button. For most of you, I think that should be pretty easy and a pretty good trade-off for the three hours Hours that David and I spend on producing these free videos for you. But some of you will choose not to do that and that's okay as well. In the end, we'll all get by one way or another. So thank you to those 102 that did that for me this last time around. Thank you to John. Thank you to Dr. Bob and Ron and Terry and Tom, and TS, DGI and Options Daily, Brandon and HR and Carl and uh, VL and, and, and El Zulu and Callie and uh, Ken and Scott and Paul, Margie, Fred, Vernon, Dean, Lena, Ayakipa, Dave, Paul, Serene, Kenneth, Doug, Boss, uh, let's see, we got Craig, we got Ken, we got Nick, we got William and Susan, the list goes on and on. Stock Market Junkie, Jeff, I can't get to all of you, but the point is I appreciate all of you nonetheless. We see those, those notifications coming through. We know those of you that support us oftentimes do so uh, religiously nearly every single day, and we really, really do appreciate that. It, it's, it means the world to us as a small business. Uh, as I was mentioning to uh, our class earlier today, Remember, David and I are, are a two-man team here at Market Scholars. Uh, we don't have uh, the capital to put together on a uh, on a on a uh, on a let's say a, a TV commercial like on a Super Bowl or something like that. 
Uh, we don't have the ability to fund a sales team uh, the way that it used to work at our prior business at Invest Tools, right? We're just two guys trying to make a go of it. And so our easiest way to get the word out about our organization and uh, to do it in a cost-effective way uh, is to use social media, which is why we're doing things like these free videos on YouTube and uh, spend as much time as we do on on Twitter and Facebook trying to get the word out. So that's why we ask you guys for the likes. It's not that uh, we need like an ego boost or anything like that. It's simply because we're business owners and we're trying to survive as business owners and this is the best way that we know how to do that. So thank you truly from the bottom of our hearts to those of you that do choose to help us along every single night. It means a lot to us. All right, let's come on over here to our website now. Have a little chat about the factor selector tool. Uh, remember, this gets put out on Tuesdays, and so it is a couple of days stale by now, but can give us kind of a lay of the land as far as any rotations that might be taking with uh, taking place within the market. So uh, low volatility did stay up there at the top, but I get the genuine sense based especially upon what I saw out of the market today. I would not be surprised at all if quality replaces low volatility at the top. And the reason for that is there is a pretty high correlation between quality factor and the technology sector. And with technology just absolutely erupting today, and then also knowing what typically makes up low volatility, there you have a, a pretty healthy allocation towards utilities and REITs. And knowing that they were out of favor today on a day when technology was up huge, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we have a flip-flop of those two next week, but stay tuned. Sometimes I, I take a shot like that and make a guess and I end up with egg on my face. But right now, judging by how I'm watching the market and witnessing what I'm seeing there, I'm gonna guess that there's a pretty decent chance that we could see a transition as soon as next week when I do this graphic again. On the downside here, you can see that we did have a flip-flop in our places of five and six. The one, two, three, and four were all in the exact same position as they were last week, but five and six did have a flip-flop where we had value go up a notch and dividend yield uh, go back down to, to the bottom spot there. And again, based upon what I've seen here today, I doubt that's going to change because a lot of the core dividend yielding areas were the ones that were underperforming today, whereas we did see some areas of improvement within the traditional value categories. For instance, financials and energy are a big portion of value. Those are more cyclical areas, and all of a sudden we've seen kind of a rise in that cyclical area and a move against some of the defensive areas that would be a little bit more akin to the dividend yield factor. So that's where we stand here this week, kind of the same old, same old at the top, but a replacement down there at the bottom as money is moving towards the more exciting areas of the market and away from the defensive areas. Also wanted to let you know that we spent uh, just over three and a half hours here uh, today in my question and answer session uh, answering a number of fascinating questions. I really enjoyed today's uh, session, by the way. I oftentimes do, uh, but today I thought was a little bit more up my alley, so to speak. Uh, in other words, it was a little bit less on the macro side of the equation and more into the hardcore evaluation of corporations, which is kind of my ballywick. So I enjoy doing that. Uh, I like thinking about businesses and business models and moats and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in any of these topics that you see in front of you and you're a premium member of Market Scholars, I would invite you to watch that three and a half hour recording that I spent with my students earlier today. We talked about Kenview, the spinoff of J&J. &J. Uh, we talked about Alliant, uh, the, uh, the utility company. We talked about uh, Apple as a dividend growth investment and, and in particular comparing their buybacks to their dividends, which is like a night and day difference. Uh, we also talked about kind of a more general conversation about what to do about sold puts that might have earnings on the horizon talked about some of the um, different tiers of how you think about companies as to whether they're considered um, you know, top-notch, can't-miss types of companies that you just simply can't refuse entry into your portfolio versus kind of the middle-of-the-road types of companies and how that might impact our thinking with sold puts. We also had a question about MMP and what to do with the proposed buyout from 
uh, One Oak. That was a nice little win that some of our students had. Some of you heard that news earlier in the week that Magellan Midstream uh, is being bought out by One Oak. So Magellan Midstream has been quite a good dividend growth investment uh, and had a nice little buy out there. So congrats to those of you that might have benefited from that. Um, but One Oak also pays a pretty high dividend in their own right. So we evaluated that situation a bit. We also talked about this tweet that I had put out here uh, a couple of days ago talking about the percentage of stocks that were in the blue zone of the dividend stair step chart and whether that is historically normal, uh, what are the highs and, and lows and different things like that. And then I had a conversation about uh, the new savings product over at Apple. Some of you have heard that Apple is offering a 4.5% uh, yield on its money market fund that uh, it teams up with with Goldman Sachs. Uh, some of you uh, know that David and I live out here in Utah, and it just so happens that the Goldman Sachs division that is partnering with Apple is actually their Salt Lake City branch. And so there could very well be some of my neighbors that, that work for uh, that particular division. But um, it doesn't have the highest savings rate out there, but the convenience aspect, especially for those of you that are iOS users, uh, that you can't leave your, 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 your iPhone, uh, you know, behind that type of a person, I think it's a pretty attractive offering there for the convenience of it as well. So we talked about that a bit. So anyway, uh, a fun class here today. Uh, soaked up a lot of time there discussing some of my favorite topics. All right, let's go ahead and get back on track now. And by the way, David taught his portfolio management with ETFs class today as well. So uh, some of you may want to check out that recording if you missed his class there. All right, let me come back on over here to the charts now. Let's do some 12 grid analysis. We're gonna get started here with chart 5A. This will be the asset class 12 grid. And as we pull this up here, you can see that we've got um, kind of a mix of, of charts, as we often do with this first set. Remember, the next set with sectors sometimes is, is highly correlated, but this first set of 12 grids is oftentimes all over the map. Um, what's kind of interesting to me is if you look in the lower corners of this 12 grid, remember we usually start our conversations there, Notice that the US dollar and the 10-year treasury yield both went up today. Now, that all by itself is not peculiar. Oftentimes, they move together. What's peculiar about this is that the stock market had a great day today. And remember, time after time after time last year, when the US dollar and the 10-year treasury yield were going up, the stock market was getting absolutely pummeled especially the tech stocks. That's, you know, there was that kind of philosophy that tech stocks, you know, um, their cash flows are so far in the distance that they're kind of like, um, you know, long yield types of candidates is kind of the philosophy when you do the discounted cash flow back to today. Uh, many of them are unprofitable. And so those are the types of companies that traditionally do better when interest rates are falling. So like back in 2020, 2021, those types of stocks were all the rage. Um, so it was, it was a, a strange day from that perspective. I don't really even know what to make of it. I just find it fascinating. And so maybe I'll, I'll have to do some reading tonight to see if anybody has any speculation about that. But I found that to be very peculiar because Last year, it was exactly the opposite. Uh, the market was tip more typically struggling on days when yields were going up and the dollar was going up. But, you know, uh, things do change and uh, intermarket relationships occasionally change as well. So maybe we're witnessing something like that here before our eyes. One intermarket relationship that didn't change is that typically when the dollar gets strong, commodities weaken. Notice that gold has had a very difficult week which is kind of peculiar as well because it was only a couple of weeks ago where it was looking like it was primed for action to the upside. And I was optimistic that we were going to get some bullishness out of it. And boy, oh boy, was I wrong. That thing failed spectacularly. You can see that gold has been down. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six out of the last seven days. It's been ugly. Now notice the US dollar has basically been up for six out of the last seven days. So that's the reason behind it. It's not that all of a sudden, you know, gold is a terrible investment or something like that. It's simply reacting to what's happening on a currency basis. Remember, most commodities around the world are priced in US dollars. And so if you want the commodities to go up, you want the dollars to go down. Uh, right now we're seeing the opposite of that. So anyway, the US dollar was up nicely today. This is a really impressive move, especially when you consider that this is a gap 
gap in addition to what you see right here. So it was up 0.75% today, continues to have that strongly bullish posture, continues to have um, a green moving average, price above that rising moving average. So the exact opposite is happening on gold. It was down 1.3% today. It is now trading with a strongly bearish posture and is below the falling 30-day moving average. So things changed in a hurry there on gold. Usually there's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a more gradual transition that takes place. Then again, commodities are volatile. So th it's not like this is completely unheard of, but with a lot of charts, you see kind of more of a gradual transition where it kind of tests and backfills and just different things like that. But we're seeing a more exaggerated move here all of a sudden out of gold because we're seeing a more exaggerated move to the upside out of the US dollar. This is not a normal two, two week period for the dollar that we've just witnessed here. Um, oil was also down today in the face of a strong dollar. Uh, but it did fare a little bit better than gold. It was down 0.87%, and it's done a little bit better than gold over the last week or two as well. It's kind of gone more sideways as, as opposed to the obvious downward movement in gold, and perhaps part of the reason behind that is gold had such an amazing run before it, it is now giving back a chunk of those gains. Oil really didn't have an amazing run before this. In fact, it was the opposite. They had a terrible move lower, and therefore, now that the dollar has strengthened, it's not getting beat up as badly as gold because it's kind of taken its, its beaten already uh, prior to that move. But it does still have a red moving average, price below that falling moving average. It's not a great look. However, you do have that light green background color with that kind of weakly bullish posture. So we'll see if that can develop into anything there. I mentioned before that yields were up today. Uh, we ended at 3.64% on the 10-year U.S. Treasury. And you'll see that yields all of a sudden, as of a closing price basis, we would have to go all the way back here to this gap down that took place basically the first or second week of March. So this has been a really impressive five-day rally out of, out of yields or interest rates. Um, where we're now back to basically two months highs, not three months, but two months highs. So there's been some substantial improvement out of interest rates there as well. Uh, perhaps the market is figuring out that if the stock market keeps rallying as furiously as it has recently, the Fed is more likely than not to continue to raise interest rates despite what a lot of people feel is maybe the, the Fed's last hurrah in that uh, effort. So we'll see uh, who wins that, that, that battle there. But uh, I think that makes sense to me. If the market does continue to rally, uh, I would venture to guess that Jerome Powell is not going to look too kindly upon that and is going to suggest that inflation is still out there. And therefore, he's going to have to still be vigilant around interest rate policy. You'll notice that with the big rally in yields, no surprise that government bonds struggled today. In fact, struggled so much that you got an oversold cluster signal on TLT. Um, notice that we were down 0.74%. So this is the long-term US Treasury. And uh, you're basically back here to where support was approximately back in early March, late February time period. But we have a fairly tremendous difference between where it's trading right now and the 30-day moving average itself, which of course is falling. And so myself, I would personally not be surprised if we get at some sort of a snapback in TLT. That's the way that I would think about that. We're kind of stretching that rubber band a little bit too far right now. And uh, you probably have to have some sort of a give back. Now, is my expectation that it's going to get above the moving average again? Not necessarily. I'm just you know, suggesting that we're probably due after five days in a row to the downside here for a bounce in the next day or two. I don't know when that will happen. Of course, tomorrow's a Friday, so perhaps early next week. But um, we're kind of getting, we're, we're pushing that limit a little bit too far uh, from my perspective. But, you know, Things are goofy there as well when it comes to the U.S. debt ceiling. Um, you know, it's possible that people just give up on U.S. Treasuries if they think they can't trust the U.S. government. So we got to be careful with you know traditional analysis in such a strange time when things can be affected by news. Um, foreign bonds were also down today. They're back below their falling 30-day moving average. They have a weekly bearish posture. They were down about a half a percent today. High yield bonds actually were up. Remember, this was a risk-on type of a day. 
with NASDAQ stocks rallying furiously. So maybe that helped kind of the more speculative bond category in that regard. They weren't up by much, just barely above the flat line, but still obviously outperforming those other categories of bonds. Bitcoin was pretty stable today. You know, there has been kind of a, a change in the way we look at this chart more recently where we've spent the last two weeks below the moving average so i'm not nearly as gung-ho about you know a trade in bitcoin as i might have been back here when it was really making a move but you know if the nasdaq keeps rallying all bets are off i mean bitcoin can get back above that moving average very quickly in that type of environment so we'll keep our eye on it right now it's just in kind of a, a holding pattern it's not really um you know ready for a bounce but um, it's also not continuing to push to new lows. And so you're kind of in no man's land with it right now. In terms of foreign stocks, notice that the foreign markets were down today. So, you know, that tends to make sense with what we see with the US dollar. The US dollar has been strong. Companies that are based overseas, where we would need to translate those earnings back into US dollars to val value them. Uh, will then be at a disadvantage, and we've seen that. Notice that EFA, which tracks the developed foreign stocks, has basically gone sideways for a month now, and um, EEM, which is the Emerging Markets Index, kind of the same thing. In fact, EEM even worse with that strongly bearish posture and still below that falling moving average. I noticed that uh, Alibaba and JD.com really struggled today within some of those key indices. Um, I know they got a little bit of a bounce earlier this week when um, you know, like Michael Burry uh, came out uh, and uh, said in his 13F that he uh, had bought a bunch of those shares last quarter. Who knows if he still holds them? But I think that kind of lit a little bit of a fire under them. Some of you know Michael Burry is the, the famed investor from the big short movie. Uh, but anyway, um, they got a little bit of a, a bounce as a result of that, but now they're kind of giving back some of that. And uh, you can see that's kind of having an impact there on EEM. So kind of interesting there as well, because remember, we, we went through a period of time where it kind of felt like the foreign markets were doing better than the U.S. markets. I would say that's no longer the case at this moment. Uh, it does seem like the, the U.S. stocks have taken back the reins and are, are pushing with especially big tech leading the way. Let's take a look at things on a sector perspective here. As we pull this up, we can see that um, we have a mix of charts. Notice that all the bottom rung charts are uh, red or pink colored. And notice that all of them finished lower today. In fact, they were the only ones that finished lower. So healthcare was down, staples were down, utilities were down, and real estate was down. That was actually the, the one that was down the most. So that's why I knew that if the heat map were set up properly. Uh, again, uh, hint, hint, think or swim, let's get it together now. <laughs> if the heat map were set up properly, we would have seen a lot of red patches with all the different REITs that are out there because it was the worst performing sector today. So those are all the defensive cash flowing dividend yielding areas. Those are the areas that are struggling right now. The middle rung you can kind of think of as our cyclical areas, right? Um, and then the top rung is also kind of cyclical growth oriented as well. And when I'm looking at these market cap weighted charts, the three most important ones to my eyes are the one, the three most, the, the three charts that look the best. Technology, communications, and discretionary are the charts that look the strongest right now. So it's no surprise that the S&P 500 looks the way that it does. Remember, they're the most important to the market in this current era because technology is where you find Apple and Microsoft along with NVIDIA. Communications is where you find Alphabet and Meta and discretionary is where you find Amazon and Tesla. So because of the market caps associated with those behemoths makes the, those sectors effectively the most important to the market. So when those three are the specific three that are doing the best right now, it can carry the entire market, which is what we're seeing here. So those I think are probably your strongest sectors that are out there. The best performing sector, by the way, today was technology up over 2%. Can go ahead and send your thank you cards to the headquarters of NVIDIA uh, for that one. But again, I will stress communications did have their overbought cluster signal today. So maybe there'll be a little bit of a cooling off effect taking place there. All right, let's go ahead and now get into our trade idea for the day, our trade application example to be spe specific. And what I'll do is I'll pull up chart 3A. This will be our swing trading chart. 
And the company is one that was kind of caught up in the banking crisis, but is not actually a bank. This is Fidelity National Information. Now, before uh, we go any further, I will just tell you this is not the Fidelity that most of you are thinking of right now, because typically, uh, for those of you that haven't been around a long time, you might not be aware that Fidelity, the brokerage company, uh, is not a publicly traded company. It is a privately held uh, business, uh, mostly through the Johnson family. But this Fidelity National Information is basically, you can think of it as a software company for banks. So it is basically tied into the banking industry. So naturally back here, when we were in the heart of that um, you know, regional bank crisis, this stock got just damaged but beyond belief at that time as well. Now keep in mind, in the early March, FIS was technically a uh, technology stock, but this was one of those many stocks that I, I, I talked to you about at the time when it was happening that was part of that massive transition that's taking place uh, with the sectors that Thinkorswim still hasn't updated, uh, but FIS used to be a technology stock. It has now transitioned to actually being in the financial sector. Um, so it's kind of similar to MasterCard and Visa as well. Remember both of those as well as PayPal, all of those transferred from technology into financials as well. So this is another one that's kind of doing that same thing. Anyway, um, I opted to do a bullish trade on this one today. Um, I somewhat feel like I'm uh, you know, being pulled into the market. I don't know if that's necessarily the best feeling, but it's hard to deny that there are a lot of charts that are setting up quite nicely here all of the sudden. And so in this case, I opted to do a bull put spread on uh, Fidelity uh, National. Again, FIS is a ticker symbol. And I did the 55, 52, 50s, and I got a 30% return on risk. I like the way that it was bouncing here today. Um, you know, a lot of the software names, again, this isn't technically a software anymore, but that's effectively what they do as a business. So I would imagine that it still kind of participates in that theme a bit more. So I like the way that it was bouncing up and off of its rising 30 day moving average. You can see the background of the color uh, of the chart went from pink to blue here, telling us that this blue near term line went back to a bullish posture. Supporting that, the green line also is now rising above the 50th percentile. So we'd also view that as strongly bullish in that particular case as well. So although it has underperformed the S&P 500 over the last three months, again, almost entirely due to its association with the regional bank crisis, even though it itself is not a bank, uh, it is now starting to stabilize and start to you know, kind of gain back some of what it had lost before. So kind of like the bounce here today, it was up nicely, well more than the market itself, up you know, 3.34% as you can see. And um, you know it does have a little bit of resistance here. So again, this is not the most aggressive trade selection that I had. You know, we just basically need it to stay above 55 between now and, and mid June. Uh, we don't need it to break out. So if it does stall out a little bit above where it's trading right now and just decides to go sideways, that is the option I have available to still make money with this trade. Others of you that might want to be more aggressive with it and kind of anticipate the breakout, not knowing for sure whether it'll happen or not, then you have other choices. You could buy the stock outright. Uh, you could buy call options on it and really leverage yourself. That's not what I'm choosing to do here. I'm trying to take it somewhat easy, uh, taking more of a higher probability type of a trade, selling those out of the money strikes. So again, for those of you newer to the idea of selling a bull put spread, what's happening is I'm selling the 55 strike. Uh, and then I'm buying the 5250. The reason I'm buying the 5250 put as part of this spread is basically to have a built-in hedge, just in case I'm just flat out wrong about this and this stock turns tail to the downside and it's trading at $50 per share in a month because the whole stock market's you know tumbling or whatever the reason may be, uh, then I will not lose any more money beyond 5250. I'll still lose money, but I just won't lose more money as it continues to fall. Whereas somebody who bought the stock will continue to lose more and more money the further and further it falls. So what I'm hoping for is simply that this stock stays above 50 55. If it does, I make a 30% return on my risk that I'm taking with the trade. And if it doesn't and it falls below 5250, I'll end up having to take max loss, but it is a defined risk trade. So I know what my worst case scenario is when I'm going into the trade. So it's the type of trade that provides 
a lot of flexibility here, even if you're not like a gung-ho bull in this market, recognizing that uh, you know we might be getting a little bit long in the tooth and you don't you know, you're a little bit afraid of kind of getting in at the end while the party has already been going all night long and you finally arrive and you're the last one holding the bag type of a thing. This type of a trade, selling a bull put spread, can kind of protect you from a, a true disaster if you do end up being kind of a bag holder. But let's hope that doesn't happen, right? Let's hope the markets just keep on coasting higher uh, and maybe this one will suit us quite well from that perspective, okay? So that's what I had for you there. I appreciate you guys checking out tonight's video. As I mentioned before, if you like these longer one hour versions of the video that includes a lot more analysis and trade application examples and 12 grids and factor selectors and all that kind of extra stuff, I have one simple request from you. Simply click like. Uh, it's the easiest thing you can do. Uh, it only takes five seconds and it's completely free. On the other hand, if you like the 15 minute versions of the videos where you don't get all the extra charts, but you just get a quick hitter video of only reviewing the four major US equity indices, then don't click like. And if we're under 100 likes by the time I'm scheduled to do the video again on Tuesday, then I'll make sure I keep it short and sweet for you guys as well. So. Whatever you decide on your end, I appreciate you guys checking out tonight's video. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. David should be back with you tomorrow, and I'll see you all early next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.